Good evening. Noticing the time and the presence of a quorum, I call the July 23rd, 2019 Acton Finance Committee meeting to order. And first up, we have public participation. Uh, Tara Fredericks, West Acton. And I'm concerned about growth. I'm concerned about the cost of growth. I'm concerned that the FinCom looks at dollars going in and out of town hall and doesn't consider that what the town is doing is impacting my property value. Um, and so I would like growth to be on topic before we start talking about rezoning uh, the town or Kelly's Corner or any of this stuff, sewers, et cetera. There's all these discussions coming up around promoting growth. And I think that we've got to get a good handle on what that means to us. And I would like that discussion sometime soon. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, and uh, I'm not sure if this is part of the agenda or not, but I noticed the what to spend our borrowing capacity on. And, um, and I'm hoping that we can also expand that discussion to be like, if we're going to spend borrowing capacity, like spending your principal of your savings on something that is capital oriented or actually going to make money, um, I feel like uh, spending money on something that would then promote more residential growth I think it would be a mistake, and I hope that we talk about spending any borrowing capacity on buying land or limiting growth. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, we have the fourth quarter results or an update from Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to report to you, unfortunately, this evening, as we're still uh, working the numbers. Um, our last FY19 um, warrant was July 15, so uh, it's only been about a week, so the dust is still settling. I can tell you that I think we're going to have a, a good year. Um, our plan budgetary uh, turnback or was, uh, it, it, we were targeting at least a 2% turnback or, and then some, uh, so we're on track there. Um, we know we beat the street as far as our estimates on revenue, so I think we're going to be in good shape there. And then we still have the statutory adjustments, the changes in liabilities uh, from one year to another. So um, I think by the next FinCall meeting, we'll probably have better numbers for you. We'll also be presenting the Board of uh, Selectmen also with a, a memo of year-end results, and I'm sure you'll be getting a copy of that as well. All right, so we can put you on for, maybe for the results next, next meeting. I think it's, what was that, August 9th, I think, or something. Yeah. I think we should be able to have something by then. I'm okay. hoping. Um, I'll reach out to you. All right, great. Thank you. <laughs> Steve? Brian, would you care to uh, hazard a guess on revenue? Uh, I can compute 2% turnbacks, but how much over revenue are we likely to be? Well, we, you know, again, we're, we're scrubbing those numbers. Some of the revenues uh, you can count towards the tax recap. Some you cannot because they're non-recurring, um, and they, and it's part of your tax title receivable. Um, I can tell you, well, I'd, I'd just be guessing. I think at this point, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm thinking probably, you know, 500 plus, but that's. All right. So, Quick quickly. Okay. Um, so, in terms of looking at revenue and being excited about revenue, if the new growth revenue is then going to cost us more than it's coming in, I hope we don't get excited about that. Thank you. It's a FinCom. We seldom get excited about anything. <laughs> so, point of view. Drafting committee group, uh, Christine is out this evening, so we're going to table that until our next meeting. You go ahead. Uh, I had a parent inform me that parents of school children made up the majority of taxpayers in the town of Acton, to which I said, no, 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 no. Um, I would like to consider putting in a demographic chart into the um, point of view, just to give people, since it's a way we speak to the public, to give people an idea of what the general, the, the fact that um, parents of school-age children do not pay for their children to go to school, do not cover the full cost, just an idea of the general population. Can you use the group chat for a um, 
parents? Uh, this was in the context of making it easier for parents to attend town meeting. They said, of course, they should be able to because parents pay the most taxes in town. You're talking parents that? Parents of school-aged children. That don't, oh, that live in town. That live in town. Okay. Were thought to be the majority of people in town paying taxes and the majority of people in town. And I think it would be valuable information. We need to decide whether this is the POV is the right venue, but valuable information to get out there so people understand that our taxes are really spread across a broad population with broadly different needs. I agree, and I think we should see if we can incorporate that somehow. If to, I know you were looking for demographic data. Do you have an access point to some demographic data that supports that? Um, at the request of our town manager, I have asked him who to contact to get this information, and I have not heard back. Respectfully, he gets two or three days to respond and then go to Ava, like I asked you to begin with. <laughs> Tomorrow is the third day. I'll Very ask good. Ava then. Very good. The um, federal government does put out data. Um, it, they put it out by zip code. So Acton uh, has two zip codes, 01720 and 01718. Uh, demographic data are both pretty much the same. All else fails. It, that's out there. Okay. Um, untaxed, untaxed levy capacity and what we have at this point. I'm not sure the exact dollar amount. I don't know if you have that number off the top of your head, or if Jason does. Maybe that's it's on the order of 182,000, but I'm willing to be. Corrected. I think Brian probably has the final number in front of him. If I unused lev tax le levy capacity, remaining unused le tax levy capacity, it's about 180,000, right? On the last ALG report for fiscal 20, I believe it was 152,000, and it shows zero for FY21. Well, just because it shows zero for FY21, I think that's what she wants to discuss tonight, but we wanted to get on the number, so we're out the order of 150 to 180. I'll let you take on that part of the um, In the current version of the ALG spreadsheet that ALG is working with, there's the assumption that we will use the rest of the untaxed levy capacity. Um, this is not something that Roland and I have discussed with ALG, so this is a chance for us to, um, as a committee, express an opinion about that. We'll take it back to the group when we meet next week. Well, I'll throw one out. Um, since the, um, the split between town and schools is roughly two-thirds school, one-third, um, I would be willing to use the untaxed levy capacity as long as the schools put $100,000 more towards their OPEB contribution. So I don't know, you'll get used to hearing this in the course of the year, that one, one ALG cannot encumber the next and one Board of Selectmen cannot encumber the next and blah, 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 blah. It was, um, it was more or less agreed to last year because they wanted to use it all last year. And, and we, it was going back a couple of years, we had said, let's cut it up and use it in, in one-third tranches. So we used a 333 tranche two years ago, and last year we were supposed to use another 333 tranche and leaving the last one. Um, but uh, they used a little more than expected last year. So in keeping with a multi-year uh, phase out of the unused tax levy capacity, I would not object to it all being, for, for the remaining pittance uh, the, the, to be used this year. Um, so, um, but I would by all means recommend that you use that as an article of good faith of, we have a, had a three-year plan, we stuck to our three-year plan, we would like you to do the same thing with other items, such as Minuteman, such as, uh, such as OPEB, et cetera, et cetera. I think what uh, Steve said is a great idea, get, get something for it, but uh, 
if you get down to the end of the year and you're only a 120k off, uh, you don't need to hold out for that last week. Uh, you can use that 150 uh, uh, for unused tax levy capacity, in my opinion. Um, and this was telegraphed to town meeting last year. It was part of the FinCom message to town meeting that this was basically all used up and basically and will be gone. Will likely be gone in the, in the next year or so. So I don't think it should come as a surprise to the tax base. Of course, you two are on ALG, you do what you want, but my, my opinion is you can use this bargaining chip and give it away. Anybody else? Saha? Uh -huh. Oh, it's going to be a quick meeting tonight. Uh, which is fine. Um, anything else that we should discuss on Finance Committee business? suggestions so one thing that was brought up on the point of view drafting committee is um, in the in the context of the Kelly's corner mm -hmm. or in the light of context of stop and shop putting their parcel in Kelly's corner up for sale mm -hmm. uh, we had discussed making a more explicit statement about 40b uh, and of course it it sounds like from everything that I hear from the Board of Selectmen, we're in great shape. We're going to be in safe harbor in the near future. Then we're going to be over the limit and good to go. But uh, what is the sense of the committee on on making a, a comment on the on the position of 40B and making sure that we get to 10% in a timely manner to maintain our zoning laws for anything else? Is the committee, come, do, they, do you want to take that up now or do you want to take it as part of the point of view uh, review next time? Uh, how do you feel on the topic? Up to you, Roland, if you want to talk, discuss it tonight. We, we, can, we have the time tonight, you know. Great to feel it for a 10 minute meeting would be kind of, uh, be great to get back there the rest of their evening, but. Uh. Um, despite the fact that Tara's standing at the microphone, I think Selectman like Benson may have some updates uh, that he could share uh, in terms of 40B. <laughs> Um, all right, two housing updates that I think you would all be um, happy to know about. Um, one on the Powder Mill Place development. Um, the developer will increase the number of units from 225 to 230. Three of those five units will be affordable units. And this was accomplished by eliminating the studio units in the complex. Then second, um, on uh, last Friday, late in the day on July 19th, um, the Department of Housing and Community Development issued the um, Pell letter for the Avalon um, 2 development. Now 719 becomes a key date. Um, John Mangerati is away this week. And when he returns, he will send in a new certification request for a two-year housing production plan, um, Safe Harbor. Um, that, we anticipate, will be allowed. And the Safe Harbor will take effect on July 19, the date that the Pell letter was issued. So the two-year Safe Harbor would run from July 19, 2019 through July 19, 2021. Um, DCHC, uh, DHCD has 30 days under the regulation to um, act on the, the new certification request. Um, they, they indicated in their, in the um, Piper Lane um, um, related um, application safe harbor that they would act on this expeditiously, so shorter than 30 days. So I hope that's helpful and informative to all. Can I ask a question? Um, you say that uh, the new housing stock is going to be reviewed as part of the 2020 census. When do we get uh, ballpark? I know you, I, I'm not expecting a specific date, but do you have ballpark of when we get what that number is? 
Is that like June of 2020, or is that like January no, no, 2021? No, no, the, no. Um, it, it, they say you'd, you'd have the census information by April of 21. I've been told it's more likely to come out in the fall of 21. 21? 21, yeah. Okay. I mean, they start the census, census in, um, I think it's April of 2020, so it's about a year. Okay. But it typically takes longer than that. Thank you. Yes? Go ahead, oh. quickly. Um, so mostly questions. It's my understanding that the census is about housing units and that this is something that I've been asking for for a long time is an actual inventory of housing units in Acton uh, when I was a selectman and we were doing phase zero of the comprehensive community plan. Um, the consultant, the staff, nobody knew how many housing units there were in Acton. So rather than relying on Washington to estimate the number of housing units, I think we should be able to figure it out uh, on ping from the planning board, went around and counted them all. I think that we certainly have the staff to validate what he did. But I think that based on the housing units that are here and the housing units that are in process, that we should be able to count them up. Uh, the other thing is that on the safe harbor, I I, and this is a question, I don't know uh, the answer, I heard sort of conflicting information that the applicant, when they submit their application, if the safe harbor hasn't already been in place officially, that they can slip under the wire and, and get their application in. So the Avalon people that had said they were going to be looking at 40B at the Kmart site could, in fact, slip in under the safe harbor wire. And I hope that John can comment and alleviate my concerns. Thank you. In order for um, a developer to slip under the wire, um, this is what we had with the, with the Piper Lane development. Um, the, uh, the key date for a developer is submitting the comprehensive permit um, application with respect to Piper Lane. Um, they got their Pell letter, I think it was March 22nd, and they filed their um, comprehensive permit application on April 2. The um, comprehensive permit for Avalon, which would have put us into the safe harbor, was about a week after that. So the, the key date um, would be if anybody's looking to do a 40B um, would um, be prior to um, uh, July 19. There's there, there there's one um, um, we got this be before the board. Um, there's a 361 to 363 Great Road 40B. Um, this would be uh, 40 um, um, owner units. Um, um, no, I think it, no 32 is that. No, I think it's I think it maybe 30, 32 with eight being affordable. Um, he came to both um, uh, the Acton Community Housing Corporation and the Select Board, saying, "Look, I've got this interesting project. Um, would this be something that you, pe realizing your people are coming into Safe Harbor, is this something um, you would be supportive of?" And uh, both groups, you know, said we would. So. His application is likely to would would come in after um, the safe harbor is in effect. Um, the um, ZBA, you know, can deny it as a matter of right. Uh, they can, however, look at it and say, "Well, look, this is a worthwhile thing, and this is something we'd support." Uh, the select board, uh, you know, took the position it was a uh, a project. That was really beneficial to the town serving a need where there are many downsizers who are looking on selling their houses for, say, $600,000 and what the current market is to replace that with a, a, con a, a condominium unit would still cost the same amount of money. These particular units would be going um, 
the um, market rate units are going for a little over four hundred thousand dollars. The eight affordable units would be about two hundred thousand dollars. So that's kind of the development you know we we really need in the town going forward. And once we get into safe harbor and then get hit the ten percent threshold, we could deal with with housing a lot more thoughtfully and not being reactive to developments as they come up. So I hope that that's helpful. Uh, just a follow-up comment that um, even if we reach safe harbor, we reach the 10%, if we continue to grow at 50 units a year, 10% of that would be five units. To get five units, you have to have a project of 20 units. So you're talking about you know, considerable growth even after we reach the 10% unless we take action in other means. Thank you. Just a clarification on that. Um, it depends with 40B what you're building. If you're talking about owner units, 25% um, of the units have to be affordable. And so if, it, if, it's, if it's 20 units that, that are being built, five would count towards um, the 10%. If you build a rental complex of, say, 50 units, 20% of them, or 10, would have to be affordable. However, because they're rental, um, all 50 count towards the towards the 10 percent. My comment meant that at the average rate of 50 new single-family homes per year, we have to again build another 10 percent to keep in the 10 percent category if we're building 50 new units that aren't part of 40B. Kara's comment. Um, we will um, exceed the 10% threshold um, when the powder mill comprehensive permit is issued. Um, on the um, what is estimated to be the reset number from the 2020 census, um, the reset number from the from the 2020 census we should easily be in striking distance of meeting our goal for the next decade. So we're, the I think whole we're decade. for the whole decade. So we continue to build 50 units a year, 70 units a year. Terra Town, yeah. <laughs> I guess so. We're going to build a 60 story high rise at Kmart so we can meet our 40B for tilling Power intended. Like oh, that'll work too. Uh, housing our, for all, everybody our, deserves our, right, enough. a billion enough. people. Enough. Um, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Noon. Uh, the question was, should we have something uh, to say about um, 40B or Safe Harbor in the point of view? I think it would be worth touching on uh, because it has been a common um, question that we often get in our outreach um, meetings uh, with people, and it would be good to have some, some news. <laughs> Uh, that we haven't had in the past to, to be able to report. So uh, we should probably consider a slide that says that we are within, or by the time we actually publish the point of view, we may actually be in Safe Harbor and explain what that means. Um, one of my topics is I am going to be away on vacation starting the 13th of next month the 22nd. So since a lot of us are going to be out, I believe our next meeting would be August 6th. Is that correct? Yes. So we can meet on the 6th and then we will cancel the 20th if everybody's in favor of that. The 13th. Well, I'm not going to be here. So, I'm not here. <laughs> so would, anybody, would anybody like to move the meeting to the 6th? Or is that too soon? I have no problem with it moving to the six. We just have to make sure we uh, procure a room. I don't think we have. We don't have this automatically. Yeah. No. I will. Um, I'll reach out to him. So it's August sixth or sixth. Sixth. We'll cancel the thirteenth and the twentieth or whatever. The tw was it was on the twenty seventh? 
the day after Labor Day? Is we good with that one, or do we want to? Uh, we wouldn't, wouldn't have that anyway. So. Oh, you're right. It's the following week. Sorry. The 27th is our regularly scheduled meeting. So having one on the 6th and then on the 27th gives us two for August. We're just changing changing one meeting to be. I just wouldn't be able to get an agenda together for the 27th. It's a month out. Still through the 27th? Okay. Is there any other committee business that would committee like to discuss this evening? We're good. Hmm? Oh, liaison reports. That's correct. Help. Start your end. Sure, I can start. Um, so I was at the select board meeting last week, Monday. Um, there was very little direct financial discussion. A couple of topics did come up that probably of, of interest. <clears throat> um, speaking of 40B, there was a good deal of comment um, during citizens' concerns on the Piper Lane project. Um, Green Acton was there. Um, they opposed for environmental reasons. A number of um, members of uh, the South Acton Neighborhood Association were there. Um, a topic did come up, and um, uh, I'm hoping if I misspeak here, um, uh, Selectman Benson, please, please correct me. Um, there was a uh, memorandum of understanding that was um, signed back on the 11th of July. Um, and there was, a, a, I guess, either confusion or um, opposition to it for a variety of reasons that there wasn't um, a good chance for public feedback before, before it was signed. Um, my understanding of um, MOUs is that they are not legally binding. Is that, is that correct? document which was signed by four select board members was called a memorandum of agreement I see okay. and you know what was the what was covered in the memorandum of agreement is we gave up our right to um, appeal the June 21 2019 uh, decision of the de uh, of, of Department of Housing and Community Development uh, with respect to their denial or, or their overturning um, of the ZBA decision of May 13th saying that there was a related, it was a related application safe harbor was in effect through June 15th of 2019. Um, it was the opinion of our council that uh, any appeal of that decision would be costly to the town in terms of legal fees and frivolous in terms of the legal merit. So we negotiated um, an arrangement where um, we potentially, the town could, could potentially get from the developer th up to a little over $300,000 in remediation payments as units are sold. I think it's $15,000 per uh, unit money that the town would otherwise um, not get. But I think the, the important thing is that that memorandum of agreement in no way um, put the select board stamp of approval on the Piper Lane School Street development um, or in any way um, prohibited the zoning board um, of appeals from either uh, granting the permit, the comprehensive permit, granting the comprehensive permit with conditions, or denying the comprehensive permit. And I just would, would want to add to that, I, I you know, um, a number of us were troubled by the short time frame that we were operating under. We had 20 days to, from June 21 to take an appeal um, on the uh, DHCD's decision. And 
that 20 day period could not be enlarged you know, or extended by agreement of the parties. It was hard and fast. And even before the June 21 decision came out, we attempted to be proactive with the developer. And uh, John Mangerati and Steve Anderson tried to um, orchestrate an exit strategy from the project, which they just um, you know, couldn't um, pull off. So we wound up on July 1 in a situation where, OK, we can't do that. What do we want to do about the appeal? And that's when the work went into negotiating the, the memorandum of agreement. Thank you. Um, another topic that, um, that came up um, is the North Acton Fire Station update. Um, no financial numbers yet, um, although I, I, I do know that when they went to the, um, went to the architect for design, it was approximately nine and a half million. Um, the, uh, the presentation was really showing some layouts and designs and some options that they went over. It's going to be single story. We, there was, uh, I believe it was five options that um, uh, they were all looking at. Um, they are currently selecting traffic consultant for uh, the Harris, Main, and Great Road intersections. Um, I believe they're meeting a design review board. Uh, uh, there's a design review board meeting tomorrow. Um, so it's progressing along. Um, hopefully we'll have some more financial numbers um, towards the end of this month, early next month. I wanna say there's a meeting um, to solicit public opinion next week, Tuesday. Um, I think it might make some sense to try and get the town manager in here for a, a more formal update. Um, if, if we're gonna be meeting on the 6th, maybe we invite him then. Um, yeah, um, just because we are barreling towards the December 10th town meeting and uh, I, think it, I think it might make some sense to have something more formal to look at uh, well in advance of that. Um, another topic that came up that was voted on was the South Acton parking rates. Um, they voted um, on the SADSAC recommendation at the lower end of the range. Um, the daily rates are going to be going to $6 from $5 and the, um, the town resident parking pass is going to be going up uh, from $100 to $200 on an annual basis. Um, Kelly's Corner um, came up. Mass DOT is now paying, uh, paying the consultant to do the design and engineering work. Um, Town of Acton is still involved and does have a say, but doesn't have to pay. Um, and currently they are working with a consultant to work with the existing businesses around um, to help them manage the process during the construction. Um, the only other last thing I'd mention is that they voted on um, to close the warrant to citizen petition for the December 10th special town meeting. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, that, that doesn't mean that they can't add the, the select board to that warrant, but, but citizen, um, citizen petition um, can no longer be added. This is liaison reports. I actually don't have anything uh, right now on the CPC. Uh, they've met only once since April 25th, and that was on July, June 27th. I was unable to make that one. Uh, the next meeting is August 22nd, so the meetings from the June 27th won't be available to them. But based on the agenda, I don't think there was anything noteworthy in any of from our perspective. It's usually not until September early. When, the when it really starts, early. yep. Right. Christy? Kelly's Corner is holding a, um, there is rather a Kelly's Corner landscape design workshop on August 15th at 7 p.m. here. They have specifically invited the Acton Garden Club to contribute oh, ideas on August 15th. A couple of items. Tomorrow night in this room, <coughs> uh, they're going to have the uh, economic uh, development uh, committee and others that will be 
there'll be a report by a consultant on a, a survey of business uh, concerns um, and status that's going on in town. I think it'll be uh, very informative uh, that discusses uh, the nature of business and uh, how business is done, the type of business and, and so on. I, th I think that's it. But it'll be in this room tomorrow, 7.30. Um, regarding Minuteman, um, obviously if we're coming down the home stretch, school is looking beautiful. And I just want to remind people that one of the main concerns when we renegotiated the new regional agreement for of which Acton is a part for the Minuteman Regional School System, one of the concerns of several of the communities was that um, we would never be able to hit the capacity target of <clears throat> the population uh, target of for Minuteman uh, MSBA requirements and their standards <clears throat> required a minimum a minimum of uh, 628 uh, students, uh, a school that would handle 628 school students. Many uh, Communities didn't believe that was a feasible number, that we could never hit that target. Well, when Minuteman opens the first week in September, uh, instead of, uh, they won't have 628 students, they'll have 630. So, with a waiting list. So, things look good. So if 628 is the minimum that the MSBA was expecting, what is the maximum capacity of the school? Well, it, it, the capacity is 628, but the school had to be at least built for 628 students to, to, for MSBA to be involved. So the minimum state recommendation was also the right. maximum capacity that it was built for? Well, it's, it was designed for 628. So that's why there's a waiting list? Right. Well, people didn't believe we'd ever get close to even 628. But really, we built a building with zero overhead, with zero expansion capability? Well, I'm already talking that, uh, you know, what they're going to do about that. But, <coughs> you know, it's, um, you have to plan for the future, but we're at capacity. And so every, every year there's a class of, there's an entrance they, they accept about 200 students every uh, September, and that's what they uh, plan for. So I think it'll probably take a few years for the thing to stabilize. And, you know, it very well may be that it's, you know, as the school becomes very popular, that the waiting list will grow longer. And it's, I mean, a shame on some of those communities for backing out, uh, you know, and we had to, at least built to a minimum standard, and uh, that's what we did. So, so they accept 200 a year, which would be 800. About 200. That'd be 800 students. Freshman class. Oh, right. freshman. So, an extra number of students. But 628 is in all four grades. Actually, 630. Okay, Steve. Um, Mike, uh, are those all within the district, or are there out of district students well, in this? The waiting list is probably is uh, like 80% are within district. Okay, moving on to the uh, uh, twin, new twin school for Acton Boxborough. Um, we did have a meeting uh, just after our last finance committee meeting. The main topic of discussion at that one was the HVAC plant, uh, there are, we now have four options. Um, the first of which is, um, I'm gonna call it the greenest of all the options. It's everything geothermal, max geothermal, with no other types of boilers for uh, heating and cooling. The second option is a, a gas powered um, sort of standby system while still trying to get the, the, the vast majority done by by geothermal. The third uh, option I don't really remember because it, it was universally panned and thrown out when it was when it was immediate when it was first discussed. And the fourth plan is a um, is a 
hybrid, the, the referring to it as the hybrid plan, it has fewer of the geothermal wells, so it does not have a guarantee of meeting peak capacity or peak cooling and heating if need be. Um, and the plan on that is that, they, that it would be augmented by electrically generated, uh, electrically generated uh, boilers, um, where that would mean more um, PV arrays on, on, on site. Um, it was pointed out that this may end up, this, the second and fourth options uh, do allow for significantly fewer wells, uh, and the wells are a source of great cost. Um, but the, the, I, I can't say the will of the committee because no votes have been taken, but definitely the will of the public that attended the meetings, the, the two meetings where these were discussed, was to have absolutely zero carbon use, so not even running a gas line to the new school. Um, so that means, I think, it's uh, feasible to expect that either the first or the fourth option are probably going to be what are most most likely looked at. Uh, I personally am all for the second option, but I'm, I, you know, <clears throat> a member of the Acton Boxer Rose senior class stood up and accused us all of being monsters for even thinking of putting uh, gas into the school, but <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Um, the Two things I want to comment about the HVAC and, and the net zero initiatives on this. One, we're going to get our first look at pricing probably at the meeting tomorrow. Uh, originally, the number, the first initial of pricing was supposed to get back to our OPM on the 19th. They wanted an entire week to read through it. Uh, that puts us past our next meeting. So we asked them to uh, hurry it up by a day or two so that we could get, so that we could see it in the meeting tomorrow night. So it's entirely possible we'll get the uh, initial pricing tomorrow. Um, and this will be the first revision of pricing that we've had in months. So this is, a, this is an important thing that we hope to get tomorrow. Uh, the other thing that I want to point out is that all of the, all of the artist renderings, all the architectural imagery that we received to this point has not had the PV arrays in the pictures. And I requested that that stop, that all pictures moving forward show uh, where the PV arrays are going to be. Uh, according to the meeting minutes, I couldn't remember, so I looked it up, but according to the me meeting minutes, it's every inch of rooftop that can be used for PV plus 140 parking spaces worth. So I'm very curious to see what that looks like when it, uh, when it gets rendered. 140 parking spaces, is that like a? It's covering that goes over the parking spots which they think is great for also for snow removal. Are they, are they putting in uh, plug-in stations for? That has not come up at all. I don't know anything about that. Yeah, they run the full route, eh? So, um, uh, the other thing is that uh, they do intend to ha start having a very concerted public outreach starting in September. They basically wanted to take the summer off uh, since a lot of the volunteers uh, that would be on the, on this citizens committee are out of town anyway, and they're waiting for uh, school to get back into session before they start their out outreach program. There will be a two pages in uh, the superintendent's beginning of the year presentation um, or note to the to the school district. Um, I'm going to make a, a leap and and think that the geotherm. Wells are more expensive than in a conventional uh, natural gas heating arrangement, which they have already. What's what would be the payback uh, in terms of years for spending more money? And, and is any or all of this uh, reimbursable under MSBA? So the reimbursable question is tricky. The reimbursable question depends on whether all the uh, the whether this counts as site work or whether it counts as plumbing. Um, and I'm not kidding about that. Uh, then there is also, so the, the, the payback, unfortunately I can't give you a clear answer on the payback because they held up a straw man for what the payback time would be. They, they were measuring these four options against an absolutely standard milk toast view. And they, then they said that the payback for option number two, which is the gas option, is 
instantaneous, and the payback for the geothermic wells one was 20 plus years. So if I would love to have seen a head-to-head -head comparison between those two, back when those two were the only viable options. This was before your uh, recommendation to the committee. Uh, the, the gentleman that you recommended came up with the, uh, the, hybrid, the hybrid option. Um, so, so yes, I don't, I can't give you the exact numbers, but yes, clearly the wildly polluting gas using monster version of this pays back significantly faster than the all geothermal approach. Well, and I don't know how the MSBA looks at these things, but from just a layman's point of view, anything that's more than a couple of feet below grade uh, would not be considered plumbing by most people. It would be considered site work. <laughs> Hey, if, uh, if Skanska can get it counted as plumbing, let's do it. Yeah, I think between options one and four, which are the most likely, I think four had the shortest payback, shorter payback. Um, Correct. The, it had so a, option one had a 20-year payback, option two had a zero-day payback, and option four had a 14-year payback. It's also widely... Um, variable based on electric rates and things like that. Based on the sun's not shining, so they need the juice. So no, I understand, from what I understand from JD, and I would love some clarification on that, um, by entering into the agreement that we'd be entering into, our electric rate is absolutely fixed for the 20 year life of the, of the agreement. And then after the 20 year agreement is up, our, that we own the arrays outright and we get any residual value out of them, which is, somewhat intriguing and somewhat worthwhile. But, um, and the whole uh, concept, not at the meeting tomorrow, but at the meeting, the following meeting is to do a full-fledged value engineering exercise and all of this, which I hope to, which I hope to be complete and, and thorough. But, um, but the dynamic that is being set up now is very strongly a, whether we stick to a net zero approach and have absolutely no fossil fuels used at all, or whether we try and be as predominantly geothermal as possible while still having um, gas use as a augmentation or as a, and I want to say safety valve, but as a, uh, a hot standby. Do you understand what I'm trying to get mm -hmm. at? Yeah, it's, it's, it's backstop. Yeah, backup. My, my question is with the whole thing is, are they going to install backup generators? The power goes out in the middle of winter, and it's out for, I mean, I've lost my power for five days, and you can lose plumbing in the building, and what happens now is there's no juice going to the building, and the systems fail. I mean, there's going to be some kind of backup generator to keep everything kind of moving, so we, we don't. I'm pretty sure they are planning on some kind of battery system so that they will not, so that they will not have, an, have a disruption. But I think even if we have, if, if you lose power to the building, I think you're not having to school anyway. I mean, no, no, I'm not, I'm not. I understand that part. It's, it's more the, the point is, well, okay, it's 25 degrees out or 20 degrees out. We lose power for five days. A couple of years ago, we had a snowstorm, and now the temperature inside the building drops below 32 degrees, and the pipes freeze, and we not only now have, is there's no backup anything. So now remember, this is a bigger problem. It's not like they're trying to build this off the grid. They will off the electrical grid. They will be still be connected to the electrical grid. Well, I understand. So but if the chances are, down. chances are that the school is actually more likely to ride through the new school is more likely to ride through a, an outage in the rest of the town because of the amount of on-site generation capacity that it has. Um, so from that perspective, that actually is so. safer for the school. Um, but the but the question is, do we? Do we build? Do we drill every single well to meet the the statutory requirements of how many wells it would take to get to 72 and 75 degrees, um, 72 or 75, depending on how much how much uh, insulation you use. Um, use more. Um, but but it's definitely shaping up to be a the the will of the public that shows up to the meetings, and they get way more public attendees than we do, uh, is used with absolutely no fossil fuels at all. So even though I look at a zero, zero year payback versus 14 or 20 as, as something we should seriously consider, 
but uh, I get the distinct feeling I am on the minority of one on this committee, on that committee. Hey, um, do we know how many Acton residents opt to pay more um, for the green energy? I mean, we're all in the, the same um, system. Um, I do. <laughs> how many? Of all residents, or all households, or okay. well, not that many then. Uh, That's a 0.8 percent if there are 25,000 units in town, right? And it, may, and it may, it's may be old information, but um, at one point I, I knew that most electricity in New England uh, is generated by burning natural gas. Right. I mean, I'm seeing in my neighborhood, I'm seeing more and more people have solar on their roof, about three or four of them, but oh, Christy. Uh, as someone pointed out recently, electricity is the only thing you can get, I mean, apart from the geothermal, the only heating source that is renewable that we can have a clean source for. You're not burning fossil fuels of any kind. With the photovoltaic rays up, we can actually get that electricity for nothing. I like the idea of an electric backup. Stick some batteries in there and you have a full system that works in the case of a power outage. I was psyched when I got my high efficiency gas system having switched over from oil, only to realize that when the power goes out, my electric pump does not put the it doesn't tell the gas furnace to run, <laughs> let alone circulate all the hot water through the house for heat. So, uh, battery backups are good too. Yeah, no, I think you know, being realistic here, if 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 I'm going to lose on option two, I'm uh, I'm absolutely going to push for option four. But um, but I was I was surprised at how strong the desire to have zero zero gas, not even pulling a line to the school, was. And I found that I found that quite surprising. One quick comment. I was just going to mention that maybe all 182 go to town meeting. Thank you. Sahana, it's still a lot, not a big number. <laughs> Sahana, nothing. Steve, Ryan, do I have a motion? I move to adjourn this meeting. Second. Oh, John, do you have any do you have any further updates? Uh, no. David. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned.